Uh, turn tonight to Judges chapter 5, please. Judges chapter 5. And let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help our minds to truly think biblically and accept what is happening and what we read in the scriptures and any appropriate application that they might have for us. Uh, Like all people, Father, we are products of our own generation and our own country and our own times. And so much that we think and feel and anticipate as Americans is so foreign to what we encounter in the scriptures. And I pray for us then that we would have grace to to receive it and to appreciate it. These are not only authoritative words, but they are accurate and they reflect your way of thinking about things. And so help us please pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I thought we'd just read through the chapter as we kind of walk our way through it. Of course, Judges 4 and Judges 5 fit together. And and in in a book that just repeatedly presents us with unusual scenarios and moral quandaries and questionable conduct, chapter four contains two. One is the hand of deliverance through the woman, Deborah. Um, and I, I made mention last week that, you know, the, the text of scripture is very clear that she was the judge that, that is in, in, in I don't, I don't want to say a backhanded, but an indirect criticism, I think, of the spiritual condition of the nation that God used a lady to that end. <clears throat> no disrespect to ladies intended, but this is something that God has very clearly stated belongs to the masculine race. The second <clears throat> rather unsavory element of the story is the way Jael <clears throat> nailed Sisera's head to the ground with a tent stake. And the, the brutality of that is, is shocking <clears throat> um, to us. When we get to chapter 5 then, <clears throat> alone in the book of Judges, <clears throat> we have a celebratory song, an inspired song addressing that. And and one of the things that, uh, this is just really kind of a side note, but there are some good people, there are some good, it's generally speaking, practice within certain denominations, um, <clears throat> probably most of them, but not all of them, very conservative Presbyterians, who believe that it is sinful to sing anything other than inspired music, so that their songbook would be only the Psalms and possibly a song like we have here in Judges chapter 5, which is a different kind of song. And again, one that perhaps does not resonate satisfactorily to the American ear, but nevertheless, I I would argue, reflects not only the way Deborah and Barak interpret the events, but the way God himself interprets the events. Uh, Let me make what I hope by now is a rather common disclaimer that I'm always grateful for the work of others, both in the things they have preached and the things they have written to help in this text. I have long felt myself particularly um, incompetent in dealing with the Hebrew poetry, and so I am in particular debt tonight to, to one of my favorite authors, Dale Ralph Davis, for his dealing with this text. And that's what we have, is a poem, uh, a song, <clears throat> Um, a song of celebration, 
And of course, in English, the way we write poetry is that we have rhyming words, and the way Hebrew poetry is written is through what we call parallelism, um, and in which ideas are either paired or contrasted. Uh, let me just give you a couple of quick examples. They're easy to find in the book of Proverbs. That's just easy. I don't want to be. I want to be careful there because parallelism, lullism itself, can become quite complicated, and the guys that deal with it get very technical, but, but, but in simplistic forms, you have sometimes the, the pairing of an idea, Proverbs 10, 22, uh, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow to it. So you have two ideas, one building or adding to the other. Uh, and so usually it's coupled with the word, some word like similar to and. Um, sometimes they contrast, in fact, probably mostly they contrast. Uh, Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. So you have this paralleling uh, of ideas. <clears throat> and, and we have some of that here in, in this passage. I mean, if we were trying to take it apart in a little bit more technical sense, which we are not trying to do. Apart from verse number one, which let's just go ahead and read that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Abinoam on that day. So... When, when the day had ended, when the victory was won, when the 10,000 Israeli soldiers defeated the chariots of Sisera, and he is nailed to the ground in Jael's tent, and the great victory is recorded, there is a song that is sung. And, and we'll divide the chapter <clears throat> the way that we would divide really any piece of music. We will think of it in terms of stanzas. We, of course, have verses but the verses give way to stanzas, stanzas. And they're not necessarily equal in their length. We're not going to be concerned about that. They are dealing with various themes. So the first stanza is found in verses 1 through, or verses 2 through 11. Verses 2 through 11. So let's just go ahead and read verses 2 through 11. Praise ye the Lord for of the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes, I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was, there, when then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord, speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. They that are delivered from the noise of archers and the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates." <clears throat> So this is the first stanza, and it is, a, it is a stanza of praise to God for giving power to a willing people. And that's really the, the, the introductory statement there in verse number two helps us to understand the theme of the passage or the stanza. Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. So Deborah is singing that the people should praise the Lord. And in this case, the, the word means to adore. Um, it really has some physical dimension. It means to kneel, um, to bow down before him, uh, because he has avenged Israel. And that word that is given there, avenging, in verse number two, is also translated revenge in Deuteronomy 32, 42. That's the idea there. God took vengeance uh, on behalf of his people when they offered themselves willingly. And then what happens in this passage, in this stanza, um, is that God is compared against the Israelites. Um, in verses 4 and 5, if you, if you think about, if you look at, well, let's just go back and read verse number 4. <clears throat> Lord, when thou went out of Seir, 
When thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water, the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Those are historical references, folks. That's not describing what God was doing in chapter 4. That is describing what God was doing in Exodus 20. So we've gone, so Deborah has gone way back into the history of the people. And, and, and the point is that the God of Sinai, the God who moved the mountain, <clears throat> Exodus 19, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. That God who was the same powerful God way back then <clears throat> is not in any way in bondage, is not in any way confined to time or space or circumstance, but he is <clears throat> the God who is avenging these people now. And, and you'll notice, by the way, folks, and this is just another a side note. Okay, verse number five, the mountains melted from before the Lord. Now, one of the days we may, we may tackle this and because this always becomes a little bit of a touchy subject. But we find this even in inspired music. There is a liberty in inspired music or any other music I don't know any other way to put this, to exaggerate physical facts. In other words, folks, the mountain didn't melt. There's nothing in the prose narratives. We talk about fire, we talk about smoke, we talk about earthquake. Nobody talks about lava. Mount Sinai wasn't melting, but here it's described as melting. If you want to do the research on your own, you can compare David, you can read the prose of David's running away from Saul and the way that God delivered him and how that he went one way around the mountain while Saul was going the other way around the mountain and he managed to make his escape. And then when you read about it in the Psalms, you have quaking mountains and earthquakes and fire and smoke and all kinds of things that the prose version doesn't tell you. God himself... <clears throat> takes advantage of this kind of liberty in music that we do not necessarily find in prose. We can use figures of speech to sing that would be inappropriate in simply narrating the story. And so that's just off a little bit of a tangent, but we find that here, folks. Right? It doesn't undo the literality of the Bible. It doesn't undo the inspiration of the Bible. It doesn't open the door to introduce sex, drugs, and rock and roll into the church. But it does, look, we do have a responsibility to recognize that music can do things that prose cannot, and that God himself puts his stamp of permission on that. <clears throat> uh, to go back to the text, verses 4 and 5 tell us about the, the unrestrained liberty of God. The God at Sinai is the God here. <clears throat> but in verses 7 through 9, you have a completely different picture of the Israelites. They are in bondage. The inhabitants of the village ceased. Traffic slowed down. People were making their escape. People were refugees. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. And you can remember very early in the book of Judges that this is what we read, that the, that the people embraced the gods of the land. This did not go well for them. That's what's being described in verse number eight. Then was war in the gates. Right? The, the more that they identified with the inhabitants of the land, the less peace they actually had. And you couldn't find a shield or spear among 40,000 people. All the guns were gone. All the guns had been taken. The people were defenseless. So the people became refugees. The cities were abandoned. The people took back roads. Verse number six, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, the roads were deserted. 
The travelers walked through byways. Nobody wanted to be seen in public for fear of what would happen if they were caught. This is the oppression that is being described. Meanwhile, God is God, <clears throat> totally unrestrained by these kinds of circumstances and situations. And then verses 10 and 11 explain to us that this is the work of the Lord. Verse number 11, they that are, or verse number <clears throat> Uh, 11, they that are delivered from the noise of the archer and the places of drawing water, they shall re there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. The righteous acts of the Lord. So the first stanza of the song, were, were we to put it to music and sing it, would have as its subject matter a praise to God for empowering a willing people to fight this war. <clears throat> Stanza number two is described in verses 12 through 23. And so let's go ahead and read that. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek, after thee, Benjamin, among thy people. Out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun they that handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flock? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought against the kings of Canaan, in Tamak by the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye Miraz, saith the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So we've had a praise in the first stanza to God for raising up a willing people. The second stanza is a praise to God for empowering mighty warriors, for empowering those who did the actual fighting. He turned the heart of the people and he turned the heart of the warriors. And in verses, again, in verses 12 and 13, the very introduction there, the Lord may have made me have dominion over the mighty. God empowers his people. And then what you have is kind of a listing of the tribes of Israel and the role that they played or the role that they didn't play. <clears throat> Some came from Ephraim who were occupying the land that had once belonged to Amalek. Some came from Benjamin. Some came from Maker, M-A-C-H-I-R in our Bibles. But Maker was the oldest son of Manasseh. So of the tribe of Manasseh, we have warriors. From Zebulun, we have warriors. And from Issachar, we have warriors. But in verses 15 through 17, you have a list of those who didn't fight. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, also Barak. He sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Reuben was divided, and they really anguished about this. What should we do? What should our role be? Verse number 16 tells us where they were. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds? to hear the bleedings of the flocks. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. So all this is going on. The, the tribe of, the, the, those of Reuben did not, <clears throat> did not go to fight. 
They stayed home with the sheep. <clears throat> Gilead abode beyond Jordan. They stayed on the other side of the river. They didn't cross over to help. Dan and Asher continued in their economic activities. Why did Dan remain in ships? The nation is at war. God has empowered his people. God has stirred them and God has empowered warriors. What are Dan and Asher doing? But the warriors, verses 18 through 22, they, they fought. And they fought, we would say, patriotically. They fought patriotically. They risked their lives, verse number 18. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. <clears throat> These were the guys that were out there <clears throat> taking the heat of the battle. And they were not mercenary about this. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanak by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. This is not a mercenary, what's in it for me kind of battle. And there was a great victory. It was a noble cause, verses 19 and 20. The, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. And there was a great victory won at the river of Kishon. <clears throat> O my soul, verse 21, thou hast trodden down strength. The, the warriors of Israel trampled all over the strength of the enemy. And then the final sad note, verse number 23, cursed be Miraz. We have no idea where this is. We presume it is someplace very close to the battlefield, but none came to fight. Nobody came out to help. Nobody came out to the assistance. And so the angel of the Lord pronounces a curse upon them. And what an interesting expression is found in verse number 23, because they came not to the help of the Lord. They came not to the help of the Lord. Not that God needs any help, but when God is going to do something on earth, he almost always does it through his people. And in that sense, we are his helpers. God is a mighty warrior. This is, this is one of the ways, folks, in which the God of the Bible makes many American Christians uncomfortable. A merciful God, yes. A tender God, yes. A patient God, yes. A loving God, yes. A God with an AR-15 in his hand, and a couple of hand grenades hanging off of his belt. Nope. Not that kind of God. But folks, be, make no mistake about it. Our God is at war with unrighteousness in all of its forms at all times. And it is a war and he is a warrior. He is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies. He is the captain of our salvation. The chief officer. So we have two stanzas so far, one praising God for empowering his people, one praising God for empowering the warriors, stanza number three in the song, and that's verses 24 through 30. Blessed above women shall Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water, she gave him milk, she brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail, and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera, she smote off his head, when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down, at her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey? 
to every man a damsel or two, to Sisera a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So what we have here, folks, is a song in which we have even more de detailed account, because we, we didn't know that she chopped off his head, did we? I'm looking, I'm looking over chapter 4. <clears throat> did, I, did I make a mistake there? No, the, the text doesn't tell us that, but the song does. She nailed his head to the ground and then cut off his head. This is a blow-by-blow -blow account. And, we, and here's some of that parallelism, folks, because you first of all have kind of the blow-by-blow -blow account of what Jael did to Sisera. And then you have this kind of blow-by-blow -blow account of the way Sisera's mother was interpreting the delay. When you read through this, folks, Cicero doesn't come across as just a good guy who's defending his homeland. The guy's a predator. And, he, and he's just doing what warriors did in those days, right? You, 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 you attack a village, you capture a village, you get the girls. Part of the war prize. You get the money. You get whatever the valuables are. That's the way it works. That's, <clears throat> that's the <clears throat> I read a historian one time who made try to make the argument that... Um, <clears throat> Uh, who was the <clears throat> Genghis Khan, who controlled more territory probably than any other man in ancient history, uh, <clears throat> that, that the, the, the driving factor of his ambition was girls. He just liked to go out and conquer villages so he could gather more girls. It's part of the war prize. But it, it doesn't go down well with the Lord. Right? This may be acceptable in some cultures, but this kind of sinfulness is not acceptable to the Lord. So we have this, we have praising the Lord for empowering the people, praising the Lord for empowering the warriors, praising the Lord for empowering this woman, a woman whose name should be blessed. Verse number 24. Blessed above women shall jail the wife of Eber the Kenite be. And then we have verse number 31, which functions, I think, as kind of a chorus. I mean, it's not repeated at the end of every stanza, but it is certainly a conclusion <clears throat> to verse number 31. Dedicated to the Lord himself, sung directly to God himself. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but all of your enemies die like Sisera died. But let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And then we have this observation. And the land had rest 40 years. And the land had rest 40 years. Quite an interesting song. <clears throat> Praise God for the power of raising up a willing people. Praise God for raising up a strong warrior, victorious warriors. Praise God for raising up jail. <clears throat> and for the great victory that God wrought even through her. And may this be the end of all God's enemies. And <clears throat> folks, there's nothing wrong with us wanting God to avenge his name and to avenge his people. There's nothing wrong with vengeance. The, the wrong is when we try to take vengeance. So, all right, I'm going to stop there. <clears throat> um, if you want to take your prayer bulletin,